Today I'm going to talk about engineering for engineering's sake. Um, my name is Mindogos Mozuras, and if you want to find me on the web after this talk, uh, here you can find me. That's my GitHub, Twitter, and the blog where I occasionally write. Here's a photo of me. Uh, that's me. Very nice photo. And that is the office of the company that I work for, and uh, that company is Vinted. And uh, Vinted is based here in Milnus, and we are on a mission to make secondhand the first choice worldwide. We are the highest value startup in the Baltics, with 60 millions of investment from Excel Insight and Hubert Burda Media. That's it for the intro, and today I'm going to talk about engineering. So I'll start with something really obvious. So you're all engineers, you're all like to build stuff. Uh, so Obviously, engineering is fun. Then engineering is fun for me too. It's something that I that I've enjoyed and that I enjoy quite a lot. And and I I I got into computers pretty early on. I remember when I was a kid, I would go to, into my father's office, and that was the only computer that was available to me, the computer in my father's office, and I would sit in front of it and play games. Um, I remember something like Magic Carpet being a lot of fun. And when one visit to my father's office would be over, I would immediately await the next one. And eventually, of course, we got a computer at home, and I used to play a lot of games on it, and then eventually the whole internet thing happened, and I got into soft, so software development. And you would think that it would be pretty obvious for me, it was pretty obvious for me, what should I, what should I pick uh, as my university subject? What should I study, right? That, that was an obvious choice for me, for someone who loved computers and software, etc. Well, it wasn't that obvious. And because I had so much fun writing code, sitting in front of a computer, uh, software engineering as a as a subject as a course that I will would, could get into didn't cross my mind. I thought about you know economy, law, you know serious stuff, right? This software engineering thing that's that's not serious. And eventually, <laughs> eventually, with the help of a friend, uh, I just I, I I had to I I went like. W wait a second. Wait, wait a second. I, c I can write code for a living? Like, really? Like, people pay money for this, for this, for this code stuff, right? Uh, that, w that was an amazing moment for me. Um, I was just having, like, too much fun, like, sitting in front of a computer writing code that you just didn't cross my mind that I could make a career out of it. And yeah, so eventually I got into software engineering. I studied software engineering at Penelson University, and I ended up working as a software engineer. And here's a photo of me working. Uh, um, and while software engineering was is a lot of fun, we all know that software engineering is not always fun at work. Maybe we have to work on some problem that we solved before. Maybe, maybe it's just something. That s maybe we need to work on a project that we don't totally believe in, uh, but everyone else does. So you know, we have to. And uh, yeah, so software engineering is even at Vinted is not al always fun. But software engineering is always fun at home, right? When we do our own personal projects, we get to pick the stack that we work with, we get to pick the project, and you know, that, these are the things that m make a, a software engineering always fun at home. But at home, we can pick, we, we, we are the bosses, right? We can pick to do anything we want. 
And when I go home, uh, I don't always pick software engineering. I don't always to pick to work on some personal projects. I pick to, you know, to play games, for example, to continue uh, to, to, uh, to play something like Castlevania Bloodlines, a retro game. And that's, and that's my benchmark, right? So if I, if I do software, a software project at, at home, it has to be more fun than Final Fantasy IX. That is my benchmark. Final Fantasy IX is a game that I've played many times before, and I've completed it multiple times, and I will complete it multiple times uh, in the coming years. And so when I, when I go home and I, and I have to pick, what will I do now? A software project has to be more fun than Final Fantasy IX. And a lot of what makes a software project fun has a lot to do with the technologies that we use, right? So, so when I start a new project at home, what, what sort of stack do I pick, right? What, what sort of technology stack will make a, a software project fun for me? Is it, is it PHP and PostgreSQL, right? Do I start some new project and I go like, yes, PHP and PostgreSQL, this will be a lot of fun, right? No, <laughs> no, sorry, but no. Uh, do I pick something like Ruby, Rails, MySQL, and Backbone? This is the technology stack that I've used for years at Vinted. Do I pick this stack? Well, it's a fine technology stack, but no, I'm, like, I'm bored with it. Like, why would I pick that? Do I pick like, all, all these new hot technologies like Elixir, Phoenix, or ThingDB, and React? Do I? Of course I do, right? Obviously, when I, when I go home, when I want to do something fun, I, I pick these new, hot, and shiny technologies. And I really hope that everything to be continues on, even uh, after the, com the company that built it got, got a little bit out of money. <coughs> so I can be a Mac buy. I like the, these new and shiny technologies. And I like, uh, like, when I go home, I don't want to do just serious projects. I want to play around with technologies, try new stuff out, and see what's, what's, uh, what's coming next. And that's, that's basically engineering for engineering's sake. The goal, the goal itself is not to build something, it's to have fun, try out a new technology, learn something, um, et cetera. And I've used to bring the same mindset to work, completely the same mindset. So when I, when I worked at my first job, that's years ago, we used uh, ASP.NET web forms for all our projects. And, you know, one day I learned about this new ASP.NET MVC stuff that's, right, uh, that's, this, 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 it was new and shiny and interesting and like every, every blogger that, uh, that I knew was writing about it. So obviously, I wanted to use this. I wanted to use ASP.NET MVC instead of the ASP.NET web forms that we were using. And what I did, I convinced uh, my project manager and my coworkers that we should use ASP.NET MVCs instead of ASP.NET web forms for the next project. And we did. And it was fine. And and, but that just, but but the reasons that I, I convinced the, them was not because I thought that ASP.NET MVC will make the project more successful. It was because the people in the blogosphere were talking about this uh, ASP.NET MVC thing because because it was new, because it was shiny. Those were the reasons. 
at the second job that I worked for, here's another, here comes another example. Like we were using SVN, and Git was gaining popularity. GitHub was uh, was becoming popular. Everyone was you know talking and writing about Git and GitHub and the open so all the open source projects were happening on GitHub. And so, like, I was using SVN Git Bridge for work, uh, but I wanted just you know to use Git just as I use Git at, at home. I wanted to use Git at, Git at work. So what I did is I convinced, every, convinced the company to switch to Git, and that wasn't easy. It's a like 200 people company uh, that's using SVN. All the code is, ESV, is in SVN. It, it, it was not an easy switch. I had to do multiple presentations. I had to go and talk with everyone. And, and eventually, and in six months' time, the company started to switch to Git. And the reasons, again, were not because, and my reasoning was not that I thought that it will make the company more successful. It was. There, there was some part of it uh, that was maybe partly the reason, but the primary reasons were, were like I was having more fun using Git, and everyone was talking about Git, so we had to use Git. And while the results of these switches might be maybe even good, maybe in the end. It was the right thing for the company to switch to Git. Maybe it was the right thing for my for the previous company to switch from web forms to MVC. The reasons that uh, the reasons for doing that were probably not the right ones, right? So the question that I want to answer today is how to think about engineering. I like give you give a couple of uh, ideas or. Uh, and how, how, how to answer these questions, how do we pick technologies, how do we think about engineering. And for that, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to give another story from the third company that I, that I worked for, Vinted. And that story is called Redisting Feed. So it was uh, 2013, and there was this company um, that had a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, and they wanted to build a feed. And that company is Vinted. So Vinted is an e-commerce platform, and we thought that building a feed would be a good idea. And you probably all know what a feed is. Right? There's a feed in Facebook, there's a feed in Twitter. It's just a collection of things it's usually the latest things that, fa for example, Facebook thinks is the most interesting to you, and Twitter, Twitter just gives you the, all the latest stuff. So we wanted to build something similar. And here were the requirements. We want, in feed, we wanted to have this stuff. We wanted to have picks. That means content picked by our moderators as the best content. We wanted to put content by brands that you follow or members that you follow. And then we wanted to put suggest suggestions for you on who to follow next. Um, so these were the requirements. And the engineering team got to thinking, OK, how do we build a feed? We never built a feed before. How do we do that? And we looked at all the available technologies and all, and all the available approaches, and we decided, huh, Redis seems, seems perfect for this. Let's pick Redis. Redis has this sorted set thing, which is perfect for a feed, because that's what a feed is. like. It's a sorted set of stuff. And we looked at our technology stack. So this is basically our data, the database technology that we used at that point. Like We had MySQL, we had Memcached, so let's add Redis to, to this. This makes complete sense. And we got to building a feed. And we built the feed, and we 
we fulfilled all the requirements and we ran an A-B test and members are happy. Like We shipped the feed successfully. What about engineers? Like, Are engineers happy about this about this project. Like they engineers got to use this technology that they've not used before, Redis. We were pretty happy about that. Uh, we built something successfully, so yeah, good. Um, so we're happy, right? Engineers are happy. Well, not really. So here's a topic from those days. Uh, it's called feed technical depth. And so we were not entirely happy about how this project went. Uh, and while this topic is called feed technical depth, it's actually not feed technical depth. It's Redis technical depth. So most of the problems that are listed here below, and there are a couple of those here, uh, have not uh, are not entirely problems caused by the whole feed idea. Th these are the problems that were caused by us using Redis. And it's not because Redis is a terrible technology and you should not use Redis. Um, so this issue was actually opened in like, March 2014. And who wants to take a guess how long for us how long, how long it took for us to clean up all the problems and just completely completely get rid of any, any problems that are caused by uh, how we integrated Redis into our stack. Who wants to take a guess? Yes. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> not never. Uh, <laughs> not never, but so I, I put it. I put the end of this as September 2015. So that's year and a half later. And the final point is like we migrated to Redis cluster. I think that that is the 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 point after which we are completely done with integrating Redis into our stack and solving all the problems that were caused by us initially picking Redis. Let me share with you another similar story. So a couple of years earlier, in 2010, a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace wanted also to build a feed. And that company was Etsy. Etsy is also an e-commerce platform. And a couple of years earlier than we, they also wanted to build a feed. And I've obviously learned of the story much, much later than we, we than 2013. So Etsy, Etsy wanted to build a feed quite similar to ours. Their requirements were sim quite, uh, very similar, and there are blog posts about how they built it online, and they are quite interesting. But the point is, they also got to thinking, okay, how do we build a feed? Just like we, they got to thinking, okay, we never built a feed. We never built a feed. Let's let's see how 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 do, how do we build this? And they also looked at Redis, just like we. And they also considered Redis. But they looked at their stack. They they also had MySQL and Memcached, and they thought about, hmm, do we want to add Redis here? Hmm, let's not add Redis here. Let's just use Memcached, which we which we already have. Memcached will not be a perfect fit, but it will be good enough. So instead of picking Redis like we did, Etsy picked Memcached. And they also worked on the feed, and they also ran A-B tests, and they also shipped it to great success. The difference is that there's, uh, their engineers did not encounter the problems that we encountered. They just, they finished this project, they finished it using Memcached, and they just moved on to working on some other stuff. Never, have, never having to think about the stuff with Redis that we had to think about. So I want to compare these two, these two, these two stories. And I want to compare this, this choice of 
of us picking Redis and Etsy picking memcached. And there are no absolute answers. Like, I'm not, I w I'm not trying to tell you that there is a correct answer in this situation. I think, you know, it's 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 it, it all it all depends. And there, are, uh, I don't want to uh, leave you today with something. Oh, you should never pick Redis in this kind of situation. I want you to leave with, you leave you with some ideas of how to think about these kind of situations. And there are two things that I want to talk about. And that's shininess and stack. So let's start with shininess. And when we picked Redis, part of the reasons that we picked it is because it was exciting. Redis in those days, in, in the, at that time, was pretty new. And none of us used Redis before. And so we wanted to use it. And Memcached is is and was pretty bo a pretty boring choice, right? Like it's Memcached is old, but the, these are like when we when thinking about these kind of choices, we should not just look at if it's is it is it is something exciting or is it something boring, right? Uh, for example, here's here's the trend curve for GoLang. Golang is going up, right? It's gaining more and more interest. And so like, this is good, right? And here's here's Ruby, right? And Ruby is just going like that for a really long time. And now here's PHP. PHP like being going downwards and uh, not becoming more popular and just uh, other languages are eating eating PHP lunch, All right? So, like, GoLang is great, PHP is bad, is bad, right? Well, not really, because if you look it, it, at it in this context, and Google Trends is obviously not the only thing that you should look at, but GoLang does not even register in the scale when we look when we compare it to PHP here. So even if something is exciting, doesn't necessarily mean that it's, we, we, you should look at that excitement in, 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 in the context of the whole popularity, for example. So Redis as a project was started in 2009, and Memcache was started in 2003. Because Memcache is so much older uh, than Redis, there are a lot of more tools available for Memcast, for example, and we also and and we also and that's what we encountered when we picked uh, uh, Redis, right? When we migra when we added Redis to our stack, there were multiple situations where we had to write some stuff ourselves because some libraries were just not available. And while writing those raw libraries, we made ma mistakes, which uh, costed it more time. There's also just a lot less information and knowledge av available about Redis. And sometimes you just don't know what you don't know, right? You might th you might look at Redis documentation and think, oh, Re you might look at read this documentation and think, oh, everything's written down, that all the knowledge is available, I know, I, I, I will, I, I will, if I want to find something, I will find something. But maybe even our, in our case, we were the, maybe we were the first company that used Redis at that scale with Ruby, maybe, I'm not sure about it, but it, it was a new context for Redis to be used at. And when you use technology in this new con in these new contexts, you get into situations that you could not even consider, and then you go on Stack Overflow, you try to search for the answer, and you get nothing. <laughs> and you have to figure it out yourself. So the point is uh, that when thinking about using this, these shiny new technologies, you have to look at at the bigger context, 
and you have to think about what tools and what knowledge is available about these technologies. And most of the time you just, just, just you gotta let the bigger companies that are actually, that actually encounter these problems that have never been encountered before and have to write some new technology to solve those problems. You just have to let those companies figure it out. Um, so another, so that was about shininess, and and Redis was uh, the shinier sh choice of the two. It was also uh, a, a new technology uh, for us to add to our stack. And when thinking about this, about uh, whatever to pick something, whatever to add something new to our to your technology stack or to use something that's, that already exists into, in your stack, you have to think about a couple of things. So one thing is knowledge. And this is not the knowledge that you can find on the internet. This is the knowledge that you have in your team, at your company. And none of us, when we picked Redis, uh, worked with Redis before, I don't think. So we had to build up that Redis knowledge from ground up. And all the problems that we encountered were new problems to us. And also, when, we, when you add more technologies to your stack, um, the knowledge that is built up in a company gets distributed more. So one guy knows about Redis, another guy knows about, about Memcached, and you also get into situations where uh, you have to, you, you start a new project and you, ha and you need to make a decision, what should I use? And you look at the available, and if you made choices before where you added and added new technologies, and you have to pick uh, what to use, it, it, it becomes hard to, it becomes, it becomes hard. Um, because, it, should I pick, uh, look, even looking at the available pool of technologies that you have in your company, it's not an easy choice anymore. Like, when, when we encountered that too, like, we encountered situations when we had debates, whatever we should use, Memcached or Redis, for this new thing, and we, I believe we wasted time having those debates because we had these two both of these technologies available for us. Um, and when adding new technologies to our stack, there's also the whole operations thing that we did not consider enough when making the Redis choice. So when, when you add a new technology to our stack, you, you also need to set up set up monitoring for it, uh, make it highly available, and just Make it, make, make, make it so it would work in production. And all that work uh, that we did uh, could have been for naught, actually. So at one point, we considered uh, doing a feed 2.0 project. And we thought about, OK, so we have these new requirements for our feed 2.0. And how do we build that? And we and we made this uh, ar ar architecture diagram, and there is no Redis in, in here. So this, the, all this work that we've, we've, we've done for integrating and building up knowledge about Redis in the company would have been, would have been for naught just be because we would have decided that, oh, we don't need, we don't need Redis anymore. Um, so, what 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 uh, what I learned from this is that you should not add uh, new stuff to your stack unless you really really need to, because most of the problems can already be solved by the technology that you use. Etsy Etsy chose Memcached, and it was not a perfect fit. The, instead of using uh, sorted sets like we did. They just uh, put everything into a, a value, serialized that value, and they had, and 
it was it was not a nice uh, nice and clean solution as ours, but it worked. And and instead of solving the problems that we had to solve, they didn't have to solve. They didn't have to waste time and solving those problems. Um, so um, th these were the uh, so that was about the story about Redis and Feed and about the choices that us and Etsy did made about Redis and Memcached. And Okay, so the, the the thing that I learned, uh, the primary thing that I learned from this is that shipping is fun. Uh, before I talked about how engineering is fun for me, but shipping is even even more fun. So even when even when I was a kid and I uh, did my own little software projects, uh, you know, console programs. The process itself was was a lot of fun, but I also had uh, a, a real blast when I could. But I but when I would finish the program, and I could show it off to anyone. When I could take it and just I would take it and bring it to like my mom. Oh, look at it! This black screen with some letters on it. And my mom would would not understand a lot of what's going on there. But I would still feel amazing about just finishing something and g having the ability to show it off. And yeah, so in actually, like, while engineering is something that I enjoy quite a lot, finishing stuff and then having having the ability to uh, to ship s stuff is is even more fun. It's because, like, I, uh, as I've worked uh, and uh, during my career, uh, I've 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 worked on projects that were not very useful. Sometimes I had to ship, like, probably many of you, I had sometimes to ship projects that didn't do anything. <laughs> um, so the goal. <coughs> The goal for me moved from just have, having just, the goal for me is not just engineering for engineering's sake anymore. The goal is you know, to ship something exciting. The goal is not to use, not just use exciting technology, the goal is to create something exciting with that technology. And there's this, the right tool for the job thing uh, going around. We talk, we talk all the time about, let's pick the right tool for the job. And I, I, I see a lot, a lot of times this, you be, this being used as a motivation to fix something new and exciting. And a lot of, time, a lot of times, actually, you don't need the right tool for the job. You just need the good enough tool. Um, because you know, you know, integrating and learning that new new right tool uh, takes a lot of effort. Effort that could have could be spent on something else. So the primary goal for me is just not not engineering for engineer engineering sake anymore. And and. How I think about engineering nowadays is I, I have two, two ideas that I want to share. So one is use boring code tech and just engineering solutions. And the, that, that addresses the shininess thing. And the other thing is optimize company-wide. When you pick some, when you, when you think about technology choices, Instead of picking, picking them in the vacuum, think about the whole company. Because what you pick will affect everyone else and will, will affect everyone else and the effort the company has to spend. And this is not a very exciting message, right? Who thinks that's exciting? 
right? No, like, no one raises your hand. No one raises their hand. But the point is that when you pick boring technologies and you optimize company-wide, you get to build stuff. <laughs> you get to build exciting stuff, and you get you get to go home and work on your own personal projects instead of sitting until midnight trying to figure out why the hell would wouldn't try to start up. And for me, like, it's much more exciting to build exciting stuff than to use excite use exciting technologies and uh, encounter all the problems that come with those technologies. So, while this is this while this is the final slide, my final message is not this. My final message is, you know, build exciting stuff. Thanks. Thanks for listening. <laughs> How do the questions work here? Should I read them? Okay. Uh, what do you think is special about our industry as opposed to other engineering disciplines that makes us susceptible to needing shininess? Uh, I think what makes our industry special uh, is that our industry is pretty new. It's a much younger industry than other engineering industries. So there are a lot, there are a lot of problems that we don't we didn't yet agree on the right answers for. And I think as the time goes on, uh, there'll be less and less need for uh, shininess. Also, when I say that our, tech our industry is pretty young, I, I don't talk just about the whole industry age. Uh, this, this, the engineers that work in our industry are pretty young too. and. I think are more suspect susceptible to being attracted to uh, shinier and new technologies, and I think as 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 career your as your as mine as least at least as mine career progressed, uh, the values that I had changed over time, and I'm now more excited about shipping stuff that I've been excited about just using the shiniest things, and I think and I think that's. That's true for a lot of engineers that work in our industry. Uh, second question. Uh, oh, which selling points finally convinced them to switch to Git? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it was primarily uh, because the engineers wanted the whole the, the whole reason was engineers wanted to use git and at least i was pretty loud about it and and how it happened is that one team tried out git and the that team liked it and it moved on to other teams so, uh, and i think oh yeah and another thing is that no one was particularly happy about using svn so trying something else was like, oh yeah, let's try it. Let's do. Let's try something else because like we've been, we encounter these problems with SVN every day. So why not try something else? Uh, the third question: uh, What is the shiniest thing you have worked with? Uh, let me think. Uh, I think. The shiniest thing that I've ever worked with was Node 0. Point, I think it was 0. 0.1. I don't remember the exact version name. But it, but, but it was pretty early on into the whole Node, node thing. I, I, got, I jumped on Node.js pretty early on, and I played around with it uh, when it was just when it was just, when it was just starting up. Um, right now, it would probably be, you know, it, it's hard to determine shininess, but uh, I like playing, uh, playing around with Elixir a lot. So, and 
I don't think that Elixir as of right now is a proven or a, or a boring technology. Uh, and the fourth question, uh, did your company finally switch to Git because it's more fun? I don't think that was the primary reason, but there was a, at least partly yes, because as I said, engineers wanted to switch to Git and just working with Git is a lot more fun than working with SVN. And I think in the end it's the right choice that we switched to Git, but the reason is that the reasoning was not always the right one. That's it. <laughs> Thanks for the questions. <laughs>